There is no doubt that if the covenant becomes the governing text of the Anglican Communion, and if, as is surely intended, membership of the Communion, or of Track A in the Communion, will in some way be made dependent on conformity to that text, a message about recognisability and congruity will be sent, and it may not be the one the Archbishop may be wanting to send. And for us gathered here, the question will then arise, painful for an organisation within the church bearing the name inclusive, how shall we make it clear that we do not wish to be included in that message? I shall turn to some strategies we may wish to pursue in a moment. First, though, a story. A colleague and his partner were to register their partnership, and a number of us were invited. There was no suggestion that there would be a blessing of this union, or anything else that might cause what we might call incongruity or unrecognisability. <laughs> but it did so happen that the ceremony was arranged to take place closely after the usual time of the Eucharist in the local church, to which the guests were also invited. Not surprisingly, prayers were offered for the pair, and the, Eucharistic pro the Eucharist proceeded as usual, or not quite. When time came for the distribution of the sacrament, nothing had been said about what was to happen. But the congregation knew what was to happen. They remained in their seats until the pair whose partnership was to be registered had received together. Where was this unscripted choreography learned? Obviously, through the attendance of many in the congregation at wedding Eucharists. But this was not, of course, a wedding, or was it? Might not this event in the distribution of the sacrament have been a picture of what in an earlier time the Archbishop would have called the body's grace, the mediation of truth through the liturgical actions of the people, while the official church was still struggling to avoid an affirmation it was unwilling to make? I tell the story not to argue against those others who've decided simply to disobey the rules. I tell it rather to show that while the primates of our communion labour at the question of incongruity, a different perception of the truth is being recognised in the actions of the people. Nor am I telling the story to suggest that actions of that kind can serve as a substitute for a just and faithful resolution of a conflict which has hurt too many and lasted too long. I tell the story because even as hierarchies struggle to maintain rigidities in place, even as persons are hurt and their ministries are denied, something else is going on, namely the emergence of the hidden wisdom of God's people, a choreography of promise, a recognition which the official church will surely have to take seriously. That will not be, as the Archbishop wrongly suggests, because the church will have ended up conforming to social mores rather than critique them. It will be because truth has been discovered precisely in the context of biblical and theological reflection and acted out in worship and what the pew sheet I quoted accurately called the current panic will not outlast the God whose message is not to be afraid. We shall, of course, we shall, of course, have to take stronger action than simply to notice what is happening among us. Among the most sinister implications of the Archbishop's paper is the suggestion that ecumenical discussions will on the Anglican side, only have participants who are signed up to the covenant and whose provinces adhere to its provisions. If that kind of provision is implemented, we shall have to take steps to notify ecumenical partners that Anglicanism is not represented by the Anglicans they meet. We shall have to find ways, that is to say, of saying, as some of us have had to say about other political decisions, not in my name. That is not, we must be clear, because we don't recognise those members of our churches who are nominated to such commissions as Anglicans, we leave such excluding to the official church. 
but we do need to find ways of making clear that an Anglican representation that excludes those who have come to different conclusions about sexuality is not fully Anglican and does not represent us. That will need to be done every time there is a significant ecumenical dialogue so that the voice of the unrepresented Anglicans is heard. That action will be important for another reason too. Ecumenical dialogues have been, however, slow their progress. Places where what is difficult to discuss within <coughs> denominations could, with the possibility of real mutual learning, be discussed between and among them. An Anglican representation filtered by its conformity to the criteria of the covenant will greatly impoverish ecumenical conversation to the detriment of all participants. At the same time, we shall also need to undermine the certainty with which some speak of a settled position within Anglicanism by making it clear that whatever resolutions are passed or covenants signed, the Church of England is in fact divided on sexuality and those who do not accept the official position are determined to be included within it. Otherwise, we shall be accepting what we all know is an illusion the picture of the House of Bishops that speaks honestly of these things, that adheres equally and in every place to one pattern of teaching and discipline, and is united on the question. Having attended bishops' meetings of various kinds over more than 20 years, I have to say that recent years have brought more mistrust and less openness than at any previous time I can remember. We shall need to speak of these things, because if we are silent, what the Church of England says will have about it a ring of falsity, a pretense of unity that needs to be confronted for the sake of the integrity of our ecclesial life. The notion that the sexuality issue is decided in the Church of England, in fact everywhere except among a few dissidents in the Episcopal Church and Western Canada, betrays us all. This brings me towards my conclusion and it was the hardest bit of this paper to write, and even harder to put through the Lambeth Palace letterbox. <laughs> and I, uh, I have to say, it's, it's quite personally distressing, so I, I hope I won't um, burden you with that. Mm -hmm.